pork, lamb and venison should be the third one on the list, not beef. Ollie Williams goes stalking with the man with a plan to do just that. Ben Heath is launching a neat meat marketing idea called Deerbox. But it's intense. It is so intense. I mean, <laughs> I mean for, for editing purposes, there, was, there literally is start calling, they start coming. Rabbit Route, Matt Turley in Somerset faces defeat by Bunny. We have the latest in our field tester survey series and this week it's dogs. What dogs you own, what dog food do they eat and what dog boxes do you use to drive them around the countryside? We have news, we have hunting YouTube. Welcome to Field Sports Britain. Any guest stalker starts with a shot on a target. Pretty convincing. Ollie Williams is a guest of Ben Heath, a stalker in Hampshire who has had a good idea. And we will come to the idea in a minute. Ollie has had to hand in his ordinary lead bullets and use copper bullets at Ben's request, though he is more interested in trying to catch the empty cartridge as it comes out of the chamber. I'm going to try this. Uh, it normally goes further back. No, I'm going to try it. Okay, brilliant. Are you happy with that? Yes, I am. Yes, because he is cool like that. So, why the fuss about copper bullets? We don't want to have barriers. So, that's why we've made the decision that all of the deer that we harvest will be shot with lead-free ammunition. And why does Ben not want to have barriers? Well, this is the bit about the good idea. It's called Deer Box, and it has come about because of coronavirus lockdown, which has caused a slump in restaurant bookings, plus a new record low for venison prices. And so Deer Box is an idea formed by myself and Mike Robinson. Um, Mike uh, manages um, in excess of 30,000 acres. Um, we have about 15,000 acres in this area surrounding Newbury and then we have um, a further sort of 15,000 acres up in the Gloucestershire area which produces a lot of fallow deer and um, up until now the, major the, the, the focus of that business has been supplying uh, the, the high-end restaurants. Um, two and a half, three years ago Mike invested heavily in Albarn Larder and um, that is a fully FSA inspected larder so the FSA inspectors come every week all the deer are inspected and they're all UK stamped. So in terms of um, certification and quality assurance on our, on our venison, it's, it's, it's the best, it's the highest. And recognising the current state of the venison market, recognising that there potentially might not be so many restaurants around, rather than just sitting on our laurels and going, well, what do we do? Oh, well, let's just accept what comes. Uh, we've got this fantastic facility at Albarn. Um, we ran a small test in lockdown doing some venison boxes and we realised that there is very much a market for this but also it's a very limited market and so the next thing that we need to do is we need to create a demand. And so the mission of Deer Box is very much to promote venison, not just our venison but cooking of venison, that, that it's low in cholesterol, it's healthy, it's got all the essential minerals, it's, it's, it's a superfood in terms of meat and yet it goes mainly unnoticed and, and, and not consumed very much in this country. What we want to do is show people how they can cook it so Mike is the perfect candidate for that. We're going to be showing people how to use it, how to use the various cuts, and really the idea is to turn it into an everyday meat, a meat that people will use to replace a proportion of their beef, lamb, chicken. Now, I mentioned the word copper bullet, and as if by magic, the firearms expert Andrew Venables appears. He is stalking on another part of the estate today and swaps over Ollie's usual 308 ammunition for a hand-loaded copper round. We have got Winchester, 150 grain, power bonded, which is a, a good take on a standard um, lead and lead cord copper bullet. The core of the lead is bonded to the copper, so it's likely to form mushroom, much less likely to actually break up. In order to replace today, 
Ollie's 150 grain, perfectly good Winchester bullet, coming out about 2,800 feet per second actually. We've got a 130 grain copper bullet, which is actually coming out of my reload at 3,000 feet per second. We gain two or 300 feet per second. We've got a lighter bullet with a lower sectional density, which will dump energy quicker. So if you go down the non-lead route into the copper route, whatever you've been shooting, you need to go down in weight, which will seamlessly take you up in velocity. If you're hand loading at the moment, it's relatively easy to achieve and the bullets are available and the increasing number of manufacturers are jumping on the back of this one, which is great. But if you're buying factory ammo, if you walk into the average British gun shop which has copper, it's often 150 grain, 165 grain, 180 grain, 170 grain. Brilliant if you're in the German forest with big Kyler's massive European reds running about. Great if you're in Africa with planes game up to wildebeest and, and things. But it's too tough for our British quarry. It isn't that the bullets don't work. It's like taking a Land Rover to an F1 race and complaining you couldn't win it. Thank you, Andrew. Now, someone's just about to say the word copper somewhere else in the UK. You need to get back into your TARDIS. What does Ollie think about the round compared to his own? We've just tried the, um, my regular bullets, which are um, the Winchester factory loaded, and they were shooting pretty much as we expect. Um, the rifle was pretty well held at zero from, move being from the travel. Um, so then we moved on to Andrew's magic copper bullets. And we shot the near side, near Munjak first, and that was, well, it was only 40 yards away, so that was pretty much straight down the pipe. And then the longer one, uh, the first bullet was where we'd expect it to be, in the middle. Um, but then the next two were slightly higher, so I, I think I might pull the first bullet. Um, and so then we shot at the target, and sure enough, they were both high. So we've clicked the scope down a couple inches, now I've got to put in a couple more at the Munjak. Uh, and hopefully I should be straight in the engine room. I think people need to be introduced to these ideas and make their own, their own minds. So I was introduced this morning and I've already I've, what, fired five or six bullets so far. And as far as I'm concerned, firing at a metal target, albeit, they're performing brilliantly. Um, it'll be interesting to see how it actually performs when it hits something that's alive, which is obviously the key that we all need to really concentrate on, but so far so good. So my first, first, first impressions is, um, Taking all the boxes. So uh, 10 minutes in and you're already a believer. Well, no, I don't know about that. I wouldn't say I'm a believer. With the constant drive towards being greener as a whole community, let alone shooting, being greener, being you know better for the environment, I think that shooting needs to show proactive, you know, needs to be shown to be proactive, not be forced by government policy. I think we need to go out there and say, actually, no, guys, we need to show ourselves being proactive, going out there, being better, being greener, being better for the environment, as opposed to being told off by the government saying, you can't do this, you can't do that. Like with waterfowl, you know, the lead, with, the lead poisoning with waterfowl, that was, we didn't, offer, we didn't do that ourselves. We were told to do that, we had to do it. So I think being proactive will paint the whole community in a much better light than just perhaps being forced to do it. Bullet going slightly high over a slightly heavier bullet, good grouping. Uh, what we've experienced so yeah ready to hunt let's get let's get to it we set off into woodland ben describes the place we are nestled in the um north hampshire downs i would say um it's a lovely area um we have a, a mixture of fallow here muntjac um, and roe deer um, the estate in size is about two and a half thousand acres and um, there's a commercial shoot here um, it's uh, like nestled in the middle of nowhere. You don't even know it's here. It's absolutely lovely. Uh, chalk and flint. Um, the majority of this state is um, arable. There's a couple of really big woods. Um, and then um, big fields. It's quite hilly. Um, yeah, so it's nice when you're dragging fallow out. It keeps you fit. And so good antler size, I imagine, off the chalk. Uh, Roebuck's not too bad. Nice and tall. Not overly heavy. The fallow, unfortunately, um, we don't get big, big heads. Um, it's just the nature of the way that I would say that deer management in general has gone. And the result is that there aren't the number of bucks present. 
So you end up with too big a groups of does and you don't get the big bucks. And so we, we, to be fair, we shoot no bucks on this estate. We have a policy on the fallow. Um, we shoot some prickets, um, but not too many. And we generally focus on the does for the fallow. It wouldn't be an Ollie stalking outing without baby wildlife. We walk and stop, call and then walk again. At the first stop, the call bumps a black fallow. We know that there are deer all around us. Then, in a dark copse, a munchak doe comes right into the call. Completely different stalking to anything I've ever done before. Oh well. yeah, that calling and then. But even, it's intense. It is so intense. I mean, <laughs> I mean, for, for editing purposes, there was the, that literally is start calling, they start coming. There's no, there's no break. Some it, it varies. I mean, yesterday I, I obviously took Andrew out for a little jaunt, and we called a munchak buck in, and that took a good ten minutes. Yeah. And he just was very slow and very cautious and just edging 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 and you just had to tease him i mean i noticed there earlier on we were calling in a slightly lighter area yeah and we i mean we were and we we, we saw a couple but they saw us and we're now in a slightly dark area yeah. so that made a bit of a difference so uh, my hunting style will change and i i fit it to how, how what's going on and Today I got a very much sense, the first area we called, we were actually in a relatively dark spot. We were in a closed area with lots of undercover around us and the deer were moving in it. We then tried an area that was much more open in it, even though we were right next to a dark area. When you're calling deer in, because they get so close, you, you've got to make sure that they really don't see you because you don't have the time. It's not like a hundred yard shot. They're suddenly there. So, like just then, it was just exactly, yeah. and and so we crouched in. We're in a very very small area in terms of maximum shot is thirty meters, um, but, but but we chose a nice area. It's, it's calm, it's quiet, it's dark, and my thought process was that deer were probably bedded up, and it's a lovely sunny day. They might be out in the clearings, but more likely they're actually bedded up. Yeah. So essentially, we wandered into their sleeping area and and woke them up um, and, and using a call managed to bring her in um, and it can work for bucks and for does you know they, they can come in as much as each other um, but I'm very pleased that we got you your first month Jack. Thank you very great. much well I did set you the challenge yeah I might you, let you say you like a challenge <laughs> <laughs> hats off to you was that a doe yeah yeah so they normally come a bit more progressively yeah. um, and uh, yeah they can stand there and bark and sometimes you can hold them so they'll, they'll actually be barking at you and you can literally hold them and wait for them to get into the right position. And it's just having the nerve to wait and, and persist. But anyway, well she done. Was, she was Probably, oh, we can't shake hands, sorry, just. Oh, yeah. <laughs> she, was caught, she was courted slightly towards me, so. Okay, um, well let's, just... let's go and see what happened. We go and find the animal. The copper bullet might be lightweight, but it has torn into the little deer. It's a dead deer, which is all that matters, I suppose. Yeah, you have to, one has to be careful on shot placement with a munchak, but at, I mean, at the same time, the rumen was on the floor. Um, it's always good, isn't it? But, uh, yeah, I, I, as you said, the bullet's actually grazed. But equally, I mean, not, not being Church of Copper or anything, um, it, it, the, the deer has died very quickly. And actually, to be fair, there's a lot of salvageable meat off that. You actually haven't damaged the haunch or anything. You've just literally... The front. Clip the front yeah. shoulder, taken one of the, the shoulders out, um, and then the bullet has gone down the inside of the chest cavity and then exited it under the stomach. In the last few weeks, Ben has been testing deer box and he reckons it's the way forward for selling venison. The, rather than be controlled by the market forces, i.e. the wholesale venison price, there is an opportunity to stabilise and, and get more for, for what you're doing. But you have to add value. You can't just rock up and say, I've shot it, here it is. You've, you've got to think about how you're storing it, how you're preparing it, 
then you add value. You know, people have complained about the game dealers and the prices. I support the game dealers. They've, they've got the worst job going. You know, they've got us stalkers complaining at the bottom going how much we get paid. And at the other end, they've got the supermarkets, the restaurants, and they've got to fill in all of this paperwork. They've got to do all this work in between. So, I mean, yeah, it, it's just really taken control of our own market. The, the website will go live on the 1st of August. We've actually run some boxes. We had some fallow left over from last season and we've had some roe deer. So we ran some test boxes to make sure that the website was operating, that the cart was operating, uh, the DPD is going to be delivering the way that we want to, that it's, it's coming and it's still arriving frozen. So we've done that and, and that's ready to go. Um, and there are a couple of boxes there if somebody wants to buy one, it's there. But it goes live really with the fallow season. For more about Deerbox, visit deerbox.co.uk. Ben is a long-term supporter of Field Sports Channel and thoroughly deserves for it to be a success. Ollie has made his own version of this film on YouTube, and if you want to watch that, there's a link in the description below. Plus, Andrew and Ben get into terminal ballistics on our Field Tester channel. There's a link to that too. Thank you, Ben, Andrew, and Ollie. And Ollie will be with us tomorrow night for our live one hour webinar, How to Deal with Antis at 6 p.m. on Thursday, the 23rd of July, 2020. Ollie will be talking about how he faced Antis coming off Love Island, who wanted to kill him. Uh, we have got uh, former Metropolitan Police Animal Rights Specialist Ian Jensen to talk about tactics. We've got Barrister Peter Glenser, who'll talk about the law. And we have a late change, Tim Bonner instead of Polly Portwin, who will be talking about how the fox hunters deal with hunt saboteurs. That's all tomorrow night. It's £10 a ticket, or it's free if you're already a member of the Field Sports Nation, and you can sign up to do that and get it for free, or pay £10. Link in the description below. Now a man who knows exactly what to do with anties, that's right, empty them out of your panties, it's David on the Field Sports Channel News Stump. This is Field Sports Channel News. A Downton Abbey cast member has compared trophy hunting to paedophilia in angry online posts. Actor and animal rights activist Peter Egan told Amy Dickman, who has two decades of conservation experience in Africa, she was a very limited scientist. His assault on Dickman and hunting tourists was on Twitter. She responded with, she tolerated trophy hunting, but did not support it. Egan replied that it was the same as supporting Jimmy Savile's access to NHS trusts, implying that trophy hunting was on a par with paedophilia. Egan later retweeted a post by someone accusing Dickman of renting out her children for prostitution. And in response to this sort of nonsense, Africa has formally asked the likes of Egan and Gervais to butt out of African conservation. More than 50 community leaders representing millions of people across Southern Africa have urged the comedian and other UK-based celebrities to stop using their influence to undermine the human rights of impoverished people and jeopardise wildlife conservation in the region. They addressed their letter to Gervais, Joanna Lumley, Peter Egan, Ed Sheeran, Dame Judi Dench and Piers Morgan. There's a link to the letter in the description. Vegans have targeted a butcher shop in Brighton. The Animal Liberation Front claimed to have carried out the attack in a post on the US-based Bite Back website. The site insists all reports are based on anonymous tips and is not trying to incite or promote related actions, although openly says it defends them. This is the second time animal rights extremists have targeted this butcher shop. The post offers this advice. Find a target, know your route, wear gloves, collect some nice rocks, cover up properly, redecorate, smash, repeat. A goshawk apparently trapped and killed on an estate in Yorkshire may have been on the Queen's land. Antis from a group called Ban Blood Sports on Yorkshire Moors conveniently captured on what appears to be a trail cam a masked man releasing crows into a trap which attracts a goshawk. The man returns, kills the goshawk and removes its carcass in a bag. The antis claim the trap is on Howdale Moor on the North Yorkshire Moors and the incident took place in May. Police told the Times newspaper they searched Duchy of Lancaster property owned by the Queen in connection with the incident. They are appealing for help identifying the masked man. The BBC has made a positive film about grouse moors and put it out on primetime TV. 
Episode 3 of A Wild Year features North York moors and gorgeous footage of Farndale through the seasons. Narrated by actor Toby Jones, the BBC made the film with the help of grouse moor owner George Windarley, whose conservation efforts have been featured on Fieldsports Channel. A newspaper short of copy is retreading 10-year-old hunter bashing stories. UK TV star Phil Spencer came pigeon shooting and deer stalking with us in 2011 and even presented an episode of Field Sports Britain. Two weeks ago, his agent asked us to take down that film of him shooting, which we did. Now the Daily Star has reprinted the picture and lashed out at Phil. Royal Marines are in Scotland to learn fieldcraft skills. The third annual Project Artemis event sees them heading to Ardnamurchan on the west coast for a season of work experience with West Highland hunting. They will be trained and mentored by deer managers Neil Roundtree and Stevie Grant. Marine commandos have learned fieldcraft and hunting techniques from Highlanders for more than 80 years. Serving veteran and injured Royal Marines will conduct deer management qualifications DSC 1 and 2. At the same time, the project raises money for charity. Sweden is tightening its laws against animal rights extremism, but farmers say the laws are coming too slowly. A review by the Gothenburg Daily, Gothenburg Posten, highlights the problem of militant animal rights activists in Sweden, including animal researchers receiving letters with razor blades, attacks on hunters and death threats against farmers so serious that police moved in to protect a family. Thanks to Per Holmseth and Lisa Kidderud for this story. Myanmar is under fire for a plan to breed protected species in captivity. The conservation ministry in the Southeast Asian country has drawn up plans to allow zoos to breed 175 threatened species, including tigers, Irrawaddy dolphins and rare birds. Some will be allowed to produce meat for sale to the public. Bodies including WWF fear, however, that breeding animals such as crocodiles for food could start a new pandemic. The Times newspaper looks like it got it wrong over big game hunting. Three days on from its claim it forced WWF UK to split with WWF International and end its support for hunting tourism, and WWF UK has failed to confirm the story. WWF International supports regulated hunting because it pays for wildlife conservation. The Times printed a story based on a quote from a spokesperson that WWF UK was planning to split from that position. Two top payment services have closed a US gun shop's account without notice. Paramount Tactical in West Virginia, which mainly offers training for military, government and civilians, says PayPal and rival payment service Venmo simultaneously and permanently suspended its accounts. They also froze the gun shop's funds for 180 days, which they are allowed to do under their terms of service. Owner Gary Melton says his wife's PayPal account, which is not used for any company business, was also closed. He blames anti-gun laws introduced by the previous government. This goes back to a uh, initiative by the Obama administration where they were teaming up with these different tech giants and actively going after people that support the Second Amendment. Uh, I'm all about free enterprise. I'm all about the right of a business to refuse service. But at the same time, you can't violate someone's constitutional rights. The New Zealand Department for Conservation appears to be ignoring a court ruling and has started shooting bull tar on South Island. The DOC began killing tar in national parks before undertaking consultation with the hunting sector, as ordered by the courts. The killing of bull tar has always been the most controversial part of the culling programme, as local hunting businesses earn up to 14,000 New Zealand dollars each for hunting tourists eager to bag one. The New Zealand Tar Foundation says the move is another kick in the guts, as DOC is targeting bulls first. Could be not doing control, or they could be doing minimal control, or they could be shooting nannies and shooting young tar. But instead, they've gone out of their way to shoot bulls right into the national park, right in front of hunters. It's pretty underhand from the department. You know. And finally, you'll have heard of estate tweed breeks and jacket. How about mask? Keepers at Mildenna Estate in the Angus Glens will be sporting these fetching masks during the socially distanced Glorious Twelfth. It follows the Scottish Government not only reopening shooting, but bringing out a report that recognises sports shooting makes a significant contribution to Scotland's rural economy and provides valuable conservation benefits. You are now up to date with Field Sports Channel News. Stalking the stories, fishing for facts.
Thank you, David. And there is more news on our website, link in the description below. And I'm glad to report that Field Sports News has been the Heineken of hunting and shooting news in the last week, reaching the parts that other news media do not reach, attacking the antis, standing up for our sport. It's looking brighter, unless you are the subject of our next film, Matt Turley, who's out after rabbits, and things are not going according to plan. Now, we may have given the impression that a day with Matt Turley will have your hands blistering from the heat of your barrels. Scenes like this. Too many. <laughs> Spoilt for choice. And this. We should hopefully by about seven o'clock have hit the hundred mark. That may be true of his crow shooting days. His rabbits, not so much. It starts so well. There are certainly rabbits here, as my first chat with him shows. The farm just wants us to, to keep get rid of a few. The problem is last night's rain. So it might have put the rabbits back underground for a bit, but we'll try. There are three guns here, plus Matt and his mate Nigel, who are beating. We're shooting an apple orchard where rabbits like to sit out in the daytime. We line out, we wait, and we wait. There is plenty of sign of rabbits, but no rabbits. Just fresh rabbit damage. You know, we checked this orchard probably now two weeks ago for signs of rabbits. And as you can see from the fresh diggings here, these have moved in in the, in the past fortnight. Eventually, Matt puts the guns out on safer ground. Crow, rook and jackdaw shooting. And they have a happy afternoon in the sunshine doing that. But we are here for rabbits. By evening, the ground is dry and the bunnies are back. Matt proves to the world that he does shoot rabbits here. Perhaps not the day you were expecting. No, the wet weather this morning really hampered, hampered what we were trying to do. Obviously, with it being a dry night, we were expecting the rabbits to still be sat out in the orchard this morning. But unfortunately, the heavy downpour last night has put them back to bed. Knowing the ground, normally when you drive down this side of the orchard, there'd be nothing to see 15, 20 rabbits running through. Um, so are, you, are you saying should have been here last week? Should have been here yesterday. <laughs> it would have probably been better. Thank you, Matt and Nigel. And it really was a good fun day, despite the no shows. Now for our field tester survey this week, and it is everything you actually already knew because you told us about dogs. Dog owners are great DIYers. We asked about dog boxes and dog food in this survey. Homemade dog boxes are the winner of the dog boxes survey. And people who feed raw or homemade dog food come second in the dog food survey. One of you points out he has an abattoir on site which solves his dog food problems. For the 80% plus of dog owners who are less self-sufficient, we're going to concentrate on the brands in this survey. We sent out questionnaires in March 2020 while many of you were twiddling your thumbs during lockdown. And three and a half thousand of you replied to us. We had 135 responses to the Dog Boxes survey and 278 responses to the Dog Food survey. Who are the winners? Ooh. In Dog Boxes with 4% of the market each in joint third place are CAB and DT Boxes. CAB is slightly ahead on value for money and DT Boxes wins on customer service. In second place with 12% of the market and a 100% score for quality is Trans Canine. And the overall winner with 18% of a market of Field Sports Channel viewers is Lintran. In dog food, Dr. John wins the prize for value for money and joint winners for quality are James Wellbeloved and Pedigree. 
but most of you don't choose those brands. For that top prize in second place is Chudley's with 5% of the Field Sports Channel viewer market. In first place with a massive 14% of you feeding your dogs on it, especially its popular field and trial range, it's Skinner's. Finally, what dogs do you all own? Nearly 900 of you replied to that survey on YouTube and Twitter and the answer is that Labradors remain the most popular. 30% of you have a Labrador with English Springer Spaniels in second place at 21%, Cockers third at 17%, Terriers at 14% and HPRs at 10%. If you own dogs, you are most likely 35% to own two dogs and one in six of you owns four or more dogs. There's only one word to sum it up. Woof! Thanks again everybody who took part in that. Now from our furry friends to the wider world of hunting and shooting on YouTube it is Hunting YouTube. This is Hunting YouTube, which aims to show the best hunting and shooting videos that YouTube has to offer. Thanks to Charles McHugh, who emails me from the Covid capital of Australia. A fox pops out of nowhere from the river, runs over his boot, and he manages to shoot it. The fox, that is, not his foot. Nigel Humphreys is out fox shooting too, back in the UK. Two come charging into the call. He stops one of them and shoots it. This is the Tweeds and Pheasants channel's latest video, a day on standing wheat. He tells me the day didn't go quite as planned, but still nice to be out. Lee Hooley posts his latest air gunning video from his Corvette Hunter channel. He is out after rabbits in this film. Lanx Vermin Control is exercising his Air Arms S510 shooting squirrels off feeders. It's a half hour film and he provides a useful commentary along the way. Mountain Sport Air Guns is after rabbits too. He is in the US shooting cottontails. He's using the American Air Arms Evol 30 cal and he talks through why he likes it. Swedish Roebuck stalking next. A lad called Fritz is out shooting on Mikael Tam's channel. They get some lovely footage of deer they leave before they see the one they want to shoot. And finally some all American American trophy hunting. Double Lung Outdoors TV with Ed Detty is after a black buck, an African antelope at 200 yards on the 1024 Ranch in Texas. And that is perfectly normal for Texas. That's it for this week. I've put all these films into a playlist for you. Click on the I symbol top right or check this film's description. If you have a YouTube film you would like us to pop into the weekly top eight, email me the link charlie at fieldsportschannel.tv. Well, that is it for this week. If you haven't done so, please whiz over to our website, fieldsportschannel.tv, link in the description below. You can click the like us there on Facebook and on Instagram. You can follow us on Twitter, subscribe to us on YouTube, and pop your email address into our register page. And we'll contact you about this show, Field Sports Britain, at 7 p.m. UK time every Wednesday. Plus, you can back us. There's a link to the Field Sports Nation page there. Remember, the backers pay for our news, our advertisers pay for our feature content. So without you, the viewers, we can't provide the news service we do and put the good news about hunting and shooting into the wider media. I'll see you next week. Good hunting, good shooting, good fishing and goodbye. Yeah.